comes the Torah and tells us, if ever a prophet should arise and say, I've come to speak to you in the name of God, send him packing. There are plenty of other nutcases that have to deal with. But no, he then goes and performs a sign. He performs a miracle. Ooh, ah, uh -huh, miracle, supernatural. Somebody to talk to. So you ask him for a sign. Yes, he can perform miracles. Then says the Torah, ask him, what's God's message? And if he then tells you God's message, listen carefully to what he says. If the message that he conveys to you corresponds with that which you know about Revelation in our context, Torah, then you can say and assume that's a true prophet. If, however, the message that he conveys to you deviates even one iota from that which you know to be true from the Torah, he is a false prophet. Kill him. And if you should ask the question, the Torah continues, if he is a false prophet, look what he's, what he's able to do. Obviously, he has divine powers. Divine powers. How is he able to perform these miracles? And the Torah answers, God is testing you. Do you go for the smoke and mirrors, or do you go for the essence? The essence, what it's all about, revelation, divine communication, is what God says. And what God says, the basic rules and regulations, you already were told in the Torah by Moses. So therefore, even if he's off by one word or one letter from the Torah, regardless what kind of miracles he performs, he may resurrect the dead, he may the, the lame go walking, may the blind go seeing, he is a false prophet. Because the ultimate test, the ultimate standard, the ultimate criterion is the word of God that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And how do we know that word of God? Here is where Judaism differs from literally every other religion in the world. Every religion in the world is based on a certain individual or two individuals appearing on the scene and claiming God has spoken to me. And here is his message. I can't disprove them. But by the same token, I can't prove them either. And as I said earlier, if you believe any one of them, you have to believe all the others. And then, of course, you go crazy. That's impossible. We do not believe in the Torah or in Judaism because of Moses. Every religion, because you first accept the prophet, and then you accept the prophet's word, and you have the Bible, and you have the religion. In Judaism, we turn everything upside down. We first accept the Torah, and because of the Torah, we accept Moses. Totally reverse. But then, of course, the question is, why do you accept the Torah? Because the Torah we heard directly from God. All we got from Moses was information. Moses performed all kinds of miracles in Egypt. He took us out from Egypt. But if I want to be a skeptic, the next morning I wake up. Now, come on. Did he really slay all the firstborn? Did he really bring about this darkness? Did he really bring about this hail? Maybe it was a trick. Did he really turn the water into blood? Did were the frogs really there? Maybe it was a trick. Maybe it was an illusion. And I don't blame you for asking that. You should always ask questions like that. Don't take anything for granted. The most common fallacy that people commit, back to epistemology that I mentioned, I don't know how long ago, theory of knowledge, the most basic way that people answer theory, how do I know anything, they will say, because I see it, I smell it, I taste it, I touch it. You rely on your five senses. But each and every one of us also knows that all your five senses lie. They lie at least part of the time. Each and every one of us has experienced optical illusions, auditory illusions, sensory illusions, every one of your senses. Once you admit that your senses lie part of the time, you now have a serious problem. How do you know when your senses are telling the truth and when they're lying? How do you know when it's an illusion or when it's real? 
For that, I need an outside standard, completely beyond my senses, to sit in judgment over my senses. They say, oh, now that's correct. And that, of course, no human being has. So your senses are not whatever you experience as such. It's not something you can rely on. The only thing that we can really then approach, get close to it, and keep in mind as a preliminary statement, there is no such thing as absolute foolproof evidence. Never existed, does not exist, never will exist. Does not exist. All we can go by, all science goes by, is what is called the law of probability. I devise a certain theory. According to my theory, I can say that if I do this or I do that, certain things are going, certain effects will happen. I test it once, test it twice, test it 10 times, test it 20 times. Depending what the consequences of such experiments are, we will test it more and more and more. And then once we see the theory has been proven by that, we establish that as a new scientific fact. Is it a fact? No, it's not a fact. Because the very same scientific theory, 10 years later, may be thrown out. They have discovered something new, and therefore they have to revise it. They have to go into, into deeper aspects of it. It wasn't false, per se, but the theory, per se, was false. That's why science keeps changing, keeps advancing, keeps going ever more and more and more. And every new discovery, every new subtlety we make, we can move so much further with regards to science. But we have to learn ever more and more and more. But it reaches a certain point where we say, that's enough for me. All of you have been in airplanes. All of you have been in elevators. All of you have been in cars. Even though that you open newspapers every so often and you hear about this airplane crashing, that elevator crashing, that car crashing, that building collapsing, which means whenever right now, this very moment, this very split second, wherever you are sitting here and now, you are literally risking your life, exposing your life to the greatest dangers that you can imagine. There is no person on earth that can give you an absolute guarantee that the ceiling here is not going to cave in within the next five seconds. Or the floor is not going to cave in within the next five seconds. I don't see anyone here worried. Nobody got up since I spoke. Why? Because you say, yes, it's possible. Of course it's possible. You read it in the paper all the time. But is it probable? The answer to that is no. After a certain point, you say, as far as I'm concerned, the possibility is there, but the probability is practically nil. And that's what scientific or building codes, whatever are, are about. That we establish a certain safety code. We say, at this point, this is it. I, tomorrow, you see that it didn't work in that instance. That's an unusual exception. And we'll right away start examining what went wrong. There must have been something wrong in the way the building was built. Which means even though we do not have absolute certainty about anything in life, we do draw conclusions to the point that we say, for all practical purposes, this is reality, this is a fact. And that is what happened with Judaism. That is what happened with Revelation at Sinai. The foundation of Judaism is not Moses coming and saying, God spoke to me. If Moses comes to me and says, God spoke to me, I tell him to fly a kite. You are no different than anybody else who came with such claims. What happened with Moses is that he came to the Jewish people and he said, whatever I'm going to say to you, I know you're not necessarily going to believe me. Or you'll believe me only because it serves your purposes. But I'm going to tell you today, which he did, that in one year and 50 days from today, exactly, God will reveal himself to you you yourselves will experience God. You yourselves will hear the voice of God. Not me telling you. That was a year before the Exodus. And he told them 50 days after the Exodus, on the 50th day, God will appear to each and every one of you. So you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to believe me. Believe me only if and when you see this happen. As the Torah puts it, that God told Moses, all the miracles that he performed, there will still be scoffers and doubters and skeptics. It means nothing. But once this event at Sinai will happen, 
וגם בכל יאמינו לא אלום. They will believe in you also for everlasting. They will know that you are truly my boy, my messenger. So God first had to reveal himself to the whole nation, not to one person. To all the 603,550 people, which were just the men between the ages of 20 and 60. Not counting those younger, not counting those older, not counting their wives, not counting all the schleppers that came along with them from Egypt, which gives you a number of at least two to three million people and probably more. When you have three million people standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, exactly in that location, exactly on, at that time, at that moment, that Moses had told him, God will speak to you, and then suddenly thunder and lightning and then total silence, and suddenly everybody hears the voice of God, that's it, game is over. If you question that, you have to, I haven't got my glasses. Oh, he wants me to talk about the topic. Next time. Um, <laughs> This is all the introduction. <laughs> then comes chapter one. Then we come to chapter two. Then we can make, come perhaps to the conclusion. Um, it all leads up to that, because after that, I will just have to say five words about the Messiah. But without all that introduction, whatever I'm going to tell you about Messiah means absolutely nothing. Whatever I would tell you about Jewish teachings means absolutely nothing. You have to know what is the foundation the foundation which we shall be celebrating next week with the festival of Shavuos, which commemorates the revelation at Sinai, the 50th day after the exodus from Egypt. At Mount Sinai, exactly as the people had been foretold beforehand, God appeared to the whole nation, not to Moses, not to Joshua, not to both together, not to the, 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 the Jewish Supreme Court or the leaders or the elders and so forth, the whole Jewish nation, men, women, children. What happened at Mount Sinai? Frankly, between you, I don't know, you and me, I really I don't know. I haven't got a clue. All I know is that they all had the identical experience. Whichever way, I don't know, but they all sensed we hear the voice of God proclaiming the Ten Commandments. If you question that, you literally have to question everything, including your own existence. As much as is humanly possible to determine any facts of reality, that is the ultimate proof, for, like for anything else. That was the ultimate scientific test. That is Judaism, not faith. There's a difference between saying, believing, and knowing. I do not believe in God. I do not believe in the Torah. I do not believe in any of these things. I know these things. I know these things as much as I know that I'm standing here now in front of you, as you are standing sitting there in front of me. As much as I know anything in life. As much as any scientific proof for anything. Because it's exactly the same criteria, the same standards. And here, Judaism, Torah, is unique. Shavuot, again, being celebrated next week commemorates that unique moment in history when God actually appeared and spoke not to one man, not to 10 people, not to a thousand people, but to a whole nation of three million people. Something which never happened before and something which never happened thereafter. That and that alone is the foundation of Judaism. That and that alone is the foundation of our religion. That and that alone is the basis for everything that we accept. And for somebody to come and say, yeah, but maybe God changed his mind. Maybe God does it this way. Maybe God does it that way. Maybe. But the only way that that can happen, and I could possibly accept that, if there's going to be a new revelation in front of all the people of Israel. Anything else is challenging that which we know for sure with something that at best may be a doubtful experience. And that's why a Jew is, is able and capable and ready to lay down his life for his belief. There's not another religion, there's not another faith group on earth that has ever claimed a public revelation, a public test for their beliefs. So it's either you believe the prophet or you do not believe the prophet.